I'm Diane Ravitch. Uh, I'm research professor of education at New York University. At, th at this moment in time in our history, uh, teachers are massively demoralized across the country. Uh, there has been for the past two or three years and perhaps for the, most of the past decade, uh, an anti-teacher line of argument in the public media. Uh, and we see state after state pushing legislation that says uh, if test scores are low, it's the fault of the teachers. Uh, this isn't true. In, in fact, uh, the, the test scores are come about for many different reasons. Um, mostly they're correlated with family income. Uh, and so when you look at any testing program, any standardized testing program, you see the most affluent kids have the highest scores and the poorest kids have the lowest scores. And uh, the politicians want to tie this to the teachers. Uh, and I think that having spoken to many, many teachers over the past two years, I can say that the uh, degree of demoralization across the country is profound. I think that the, the easiest thing to do for te to support teachers is just to have a formal program of saying thank you, thank you for serving, to recognize that those who teach are in fact performing a public service. People don't go into teaching in the, uh, with the hope of making a, a large income. Uh, there, there are many other ways they could make more money than becoming a teacher. They understand that their lifetime income will be less than those of their classmates who choose other lines of work. This is public service, and I think that uh, what we should be doing uh, at every level of our society is expressing gratitude to teachers, uh, but not lip service. And I think that teachers are very quick to spot phony lip service, and they see it from politicians, they see it from high-level officials in the government who uh, issue their thanks on uh, Teacher Appreciation Day, but the rest of the year uh, blame teachers for things that are way beyond their control. So I'd say that uh, teachers need to feel that they're respected members of the community, uh, but more than that, they need to, we as a society have to stop blaming them uh, for social conditions that have been created by the outsourcing of jobs, uh, by the growing income gap in our society, by the growing levels of poverty. I mean, the, to me, the most outrageous fact of our society today is that more than 20% of our children live in poverty. And uh, we're always talking about we want to be number one. Well, we're number one in child poverty amongst the uh, highly developed nations of the world. And this should be a scandal that's talked about all the time. Uh, so the arts can't heal that gap. But the, the, certainly the arts can bring comfort, spiritual expression, um, support to children, to young adults. Uh, and the people who do this are uh, doing, I think, the most important work of our society. And we need to thank them every day, but also support them in the work that they do and stop this uh, national media obsession with blaming teachers for problems created by politicians and by um, uh, corporations and by others who are heedless of the well-being of our society. Well, families are crucial, and, and they're crucial for uh, some obvious reasons. Uh, before children arrive in school, they have been either exposed to a lot of very vocabulary or a little vocabulary, and that makes a big difference. Uh, whether children have uh, you know, basic food needs met, health needs met, that's all up to their family. It's not, first of all, up to their school. So the family is crucial in terms of setting the stage for children even being open to education and willing to uh, engage uh, usefully in the classroom. I think that arts educators have uh, some very unusual opportunities to partner with families because there's so much that arts educators do that families absolutely love. You know, when children are engaged in a play, uh, when they're engaged in a musical performance, uh, the families love to come and see their children perform. So this is an opportunity to draw families in in a way that many other teachers don't have. Uh, and it, it creates a powerful partnership when the parents see their children on stage or see that they have created something in the classroom and they bring home their work. And um, th there's a much more, I think, uh, open flow of communication between arts educators and families uh, through the children and through the work of the children uh, where arts educators can be uh, very actively engaged with families. Well, I'd say that my first exposure to the arts was in school. Um, and um, I, I'm going to say in my talk today that uh, one of the things I regret in life is that when my mother tried to make me take piano lessons, I didn't listen to her. I should have. I cut 
piano lessons, went to play baseball. Um, but in school, we, we were taken to the orchestra. This was in Houston, which is pretty unusual. Uh, and we were exposed to museums, and it just seemed to be a, a natural part of school life. Uh, as an adult, I've always loved the arts. I go to museums. I love, love Broadway plays. Uh, and it's just uh, such an important part of my own life. And it, it seems criminal somehow not to make that part of, of young children's lives in school. But I think that there are many ways to engage in the arts, some of them quite personal, and others at, 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 at a remove. I mean, seeing a play in a way is at a remove, but I'm always just incredibly impressed uh, by the people who, who perform and can transform themselves into another personality and make you believe in a totally new reality uh, where you uh, do something that in the theater would be called a willing suspension of disbelief. You really can believe that people can fly, or you really can believe that you're in a different century or in a different world. And that's, that's a magical experience. I did try as an adult to start piano lessons, but I found myself so impatient that I, didn't, I couldn't discipline myself. I can only discipline myself to do one thing, and that's to write. I have iron concentration when it comes to writing. I can will out the rest of the world. And I like to think that, my, that by writing, I'm doing something that's also, in, in its own way, it's creative. Writing involves taking words out of the air and turning them into sentences that somebody else can understand. So I think that's creative, but that seems to be the only creative thing that I can do. I've failed at painting. I've failed at dancing. I, when I watch people do line dancing, I just stand there in awe, and I think, how do they know which way to go? I mean, if I joined a line dance crew, I'd be falling down on my face every other minute. I wouldn't know which way to go. Everybody would go to the right, I'd go to the left. Uh, but the one thing I can do is I have this uh, iron concentration for my work of writing. Um, and uh, uh, I may yet learn to play the piano. I w I'm not giving up hope yet. <laughs>